of the Apostle Paul, the soul winner. The testimony of the Apostle Paul, the soul winner. You know, when it comes to thinking of Bible characters in the New Testament, of course, we start out with the Lord. But after we pass the Lord, we may come to Peter. We may come to John. But I suspect very soon in our thinking of those great saints of the, Old Te of the New Testament, we're going to come to Paul. What a man of God he was. What a soul winner he was. What a passion for souls he had. When we think of Paul, we think of Paul, the soul winner. We think of that verse where he said in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. A necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. What a great man of God the apostle Paul was. But you know, we need to understand that all of these great men of the Bible are God-given examples for you and I as believers to learn from and to follow. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, he said, Be followers of me. Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. In our text of Romans chapter 1, verses 13 and 17, we have Paul giving a testimony of something that we need to make sure that we imitate in our life, emulate in our life, learn to follow. He said in verse 13, he said, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you, but was let other to you, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Now, you know what the fruit is in that verse? It's souls coming to the Savior. Souls whom we've had a part in and, and taken the gospel to them. And they come to Jesus Christ and trust him as Lord and Savior. And Paul said, I want to have some fruit. I want to have some fruit in Rome. Oh, brethren, listen to me. If you're saved today, you ought to want to have fruit. The fruit of souls coming to the Savior. That ought to be burning in your heart. That ought to be a passion in your heart. That you have in your heart every day from the moment you get up. To the moment you go to bed. In John 15 verse 16. The Lord said to his disciples. You've not chosen me. But I've chosen you and ordained you. That you should go and bring forth fruit. And that your fruit should remain. Brethren I know of only one fruit that remains. And that's a sinner that comes to the Savior. Because he has eternal life. And brethren God is saying to us today. Who are saved. I've chosen you and I've ordained you. That you should go forth and bring forth fruit. And that your fruit should remain. Paul went on and said, he said, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. Praise God if you're saved today, amen? Praise God you are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. They've been washed in the blood of Christ. You've been robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You are a child of God forever, and one day you'll be with the Lord Jesus forever in heaven. All of these wonderful blessings are yours because you've accepted the Lord as your Savior. And my friend... That ought to make us debtors to others. That will make us desire to share that wonderful news of Jesus Christ to others, our family, and those around us and even beyond. He goes on and says, so as much as in me, and I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And if you're Satan heaven bound this morning, I want to ask you a question. Take it serious. It's a good Bible question. Are you ready to share the gospel with others? Are you ready to share the gospel with others? You know, that word ready means not just to be equipped. That word ready means I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And so I ask you, are you sharing the gospel with others? Then he tells us how he's ready to preach the gospel. He says in verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Then verse 17, he said, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. Let's pray. Our Father, we want to come to you this morning and thank you for this time of our worship. When we open up the word of God and we let the Holy Spirit have his way, I trust, Lord, that music has been preparing us for that. And now, Lord, we must hear from you. Lord, you know our hearts today. You know each one of us individually. There's some perhaps are not saved and need to get saved. There's others that are saved and we just need to let you teach us and correct us and encourage us or instruct us. Have your way, Holy Spirit. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I've been with Health Ministries now for seven years. If you'd asked me eight years ago what I'd be doing, what I'm doing, I would have said, no way, I'm a pastor. I'll be pastoring until the Lord takes me home. But no, the Lord had different direction for me. And he called me into this ministry of helping National Baptist preachers 
and third world nations to continue to do what they're doing, but doing more of what they're doing. And that is preaching the gospel and planting churches that will preach the gospel. I never thought I'd do all the international traveling that I'm doing. Never thought I would go to India one day. Been there four times now. Never thought I would go to Tanzania. Never thought I would go to the, uh, to the uh, Pakistan uh, and all the problems that are in that nation. Uh, never thought those days would come. I never thought I'd be going to Kenya, but I'm doing all of this. And, and what I've observed about these churches, when I say the churches, I'm not just talking about the preacher. I'm talking about the people that are sitting in the pews like you are today. And when I've observed these churches and these third world nations, I find they're focused on the Lord's command. They're focused on that command that says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They're devoted to the work of the ministry. They're addicted to the work of the ministry. Lost souls are on their mind every day. They're soul winning every day. Peter Tumai, whom you know, who we have here, one of our missionaries, I called him around Christmas time and said, I asked him, what are you doing? And, and he told me he had this schedule for he'll be in this church preaching and be over here preaching, be over all through the month of Christmas. And I said, are you coming home for Christmas Day? Well, he said, we'll be there for a few hours and then we're, we're heading back out to go to another place and preach the gospel. Peter has started 97 churches since 1996. The Wissi Patala, who we had here, planted seven churches since he was here in 2018, making a total of nine and going back to start his 10th. Silas of Myanmar planted seven churches, or 10 churches with a vision to plant 50 more in his nation. Nazareth of Northeast India planted six churches with a vision to preach the gospel and plant churches throughout the mountains of Northeast India. And all these men, when I say churches, I'm not talking about a building, I'm talking about you and I, people. And all these men have a, an everyday passion for people, a passion to go preach the gospel, to disciple the believers, to teach them to share the gospel of Christ, to plant churches that will go preach the gospel, and plant churches that will go preach the gospel, and plant churches that will go preach the gospel. There's an urgency in their everyday walk with the Lord to share the gospel with others and uh, their pastors of a church at the same time. And brethren, can I say to you, my, they go through it. There's a cost for what they do. They're persecuted. They're beaten up. They go without food at times. I've talked to them. I've asked them every national, is there ever a time, ever a time when you don't have food to eat? He says, oh yes, we have had those times. Hardships, rejections, family rejections, nation rejections. Listen, they are persecuted, but yet that passion and that zeal and that desire to share the gospel does not go out. That's a flame that burns brighter. And I find myself, I come back to the States and, you know, I, I've been all over the Southeast in churches. I never thought I'd be doing that either. I've been all over the Northeast in churches. And I find myself comparing the churches in the third world nations to our churches back here at home. And I find that we're slow slow to share the gospel i find that there's no urgency for the need to get the gospel to our neighbors and beyond we debate whether or not to witness to someone we try to figure out is it the right time to to give a track we struggle to hand out a track or give an invitation to church or share the gospel with someone we often talk ourselves out of witnessing for jesus and pastors across america have to beg and plead for the church to go share the gospel with someone or hand a track out to someone. And when the Holy Spirit moves us in the sermon to be a soul winner and I'm going to do it and we maybe come forward and pray at the altar or maybe we pray in our seat, but we never get around to it. Our churches today are filled with members and we're sharing the gospels not even on their mind. Even here in West Side Baptist Church, we have members, never is it on your mind to share the gospel. And we go through day after day, living the pressures and the pleasures of this life with no thought for the lost. They're dying and going to hell. Get up in the morning, put on our clothes, and maybe we have a devotion, maybe we don't. But we've got to get to work. Our mind's on our work, we get to work, and we go through our day trying to get our work done, but while we're doing it, we're thinking about what we want to do when we get home.
or maybe planning a vacation down the road. We go home and we have our meal. Maybe we watch a little television or much television. We go to bed. We don't think about a soul that needs Jesus as Savior. I have a saying to describe the contrast between the churches of the third world nations in the churches in America. When I say church, I'm talking about churches like ours, Baptist churches, fundamental Baptist churches. I have a saying, the churches in third world nations are skinny and busy in the work of the Lord. The churches in America are fat and lazy in the work of the Lord. We live as if there's a second chance after death and there's not. Can I remind you of some Bible truth that I know you know? John 3, 36, he that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son should not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's truth. That's truth. For every sinner without Savior, the wrath of God's on him. Oh, praise God for his love that's reaching out to him. But that reaching out to him is, is through you and I. We are the love givers today. He didn't call angels to do it. He called you and I to do it. We are the love givers. And, and God's love wants to be given to that that lone believer but listen if he rejects christ or if he never hears christ the wrath of god's on him one day he'll stand before god give the count of his sin and cast in the lake of fire forever according to his wickedness romans 6 23 the rage of sin is death but the gift of god's eternal life through jesus christ our lord hebrews 9 verse 27 it's appointed men once to die it's coming man it's coming ladies we're going to die one day, but after this, the judgment. Luke 16, 22, the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is a day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not next week. Today's the day that we need to get the gospel out to people with an urgency and a fervency and a passion for lost. And so by the grace of God, I want to give you four thoughts today from the Bible that I pray would be an encouragement unto you in the most important work that you have to do on the face of this earth, a work that needs to be done with a burden and with a zeal and with urgency and a compassion for the lost. A work that uh, will enable you to have lost souls on our mind every day and throughout. That's, that's where we need to be. Are you there today? Are lost souls on your mind throughout the day? When you're at the gas station, that person that's over on the other side is a lost soul on your mind. When you're in the grocery line waiting to go through the line, is that lost soul in front of you on your mind or behind you? How about the cashier? Uh, how about uh, the co-worker? I know that there's restrictions in work. Uh, you, you owe your boss what you've been hired to do, but you've got coffee breaks, I suspect, or maybe a lunch break. Listen, our lost all souls in your mind, were they on your mind when you came here today? They ought to be. And I'm going to try to give you some things to help me and to help you. To keep lost souls on our mind and be a witness for Christ every day and throughout the day. Would you write these things down? Number one, see with me the power of the gospel. See with me the power of the gospel of the gospel. Look back at verse 15 with me. It says here, Paul says, so, so much is in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. Underline that. The power of God unto salvation to everyone that believer, believer, to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The death, the burial, and a resurrection of Jesus Christ is the power of God working on hearts of unbelievers to repent of their sin and to trust him as their Lord and Savior. And when we plant the gospel in the hearts of the unbelievers, the power of God is at work. The power of God's at work. In John 16, the Lord foretold the, uh, the disciples the ministry of the Holy Spirit after he would be go back to heaven and he would send the Holy Spirit. He said this in verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove 
or convince or convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And oh, my friend, the comforter has come. The Holy Spirit has come. And Christian, he abides in your heart with purpose. Go share the gospel with its divine power. The power of the Holy Spirit is in the gospel message. And every time you give the gospel to a lost sinner, whether by mouth or by track, the gospel, the power of God is at work in what you do. Think about this. The very power that rose Jesus from the dead is at work in the life of a lost person when the gospel is given to him. When the gospel is given to him to convict him of his shame, of his sin and unbelief in Jesus Christ. You know, when I, I've given my testimony before, but when I went to that Baptist church for the first time in my life, I didn't know what to expect. I heard that they were, they were a bunch of people that were weird. They didn't have any fun. Didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't curse. And I'll tell you what, when that preacher got in that pulpit, he preached the gospel. And he ripped apart my heart and showed me and stirred up in my heart my sin. Oh, it bothered me. Oh, listen, everyone in this room, you have sinned in your life so you're so ashamed of. Aren't you glad for the blood of Christ that has erased that shame and given you eternal life? But brother, when I heard that gospel that my sin was exposed, I, I couldn't hang my sin on anything anymore. I couldn't hang it on my false religion. And every time I heard that gospel, my sin was exposed. And praise God, Calvary was exposed. And, and the love of Christ was exposed. And the Holy Spirit worked on this heart again and again. And praise God for the people of Perry Baptist Church that never gave up on this liberal John Mills, but kept witnessing to him with love and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise God, that gospel brought me to Jesus. You know why? Because it's a power of God and his salvation. Oh, listen, the power of the gospel is a power of God that work in the heart of the unbeliever to bring guilt and shame before a holy God and to make a decision of faith in Christ as savior and, uh, and, and what he did for us at Calvary and for forgiveness and for everlasting life. Hey, do you believe it? Do you believe that when you give the gospel to others, you're releasing God's power on them? that many of us do not or we would wake up with souls in our mind and we'd be a bold witness for Christ throughout the day I fear we share the gospel message not expecting it to make a difference door-to-door -door visitation used to be a, a common thing among our churches today or in the past I should say back in the 70s and 80s and 90s and uh, we go door-to-door -door, right? hey. Very little fruit came from it, but God brought people in other ways. I always found that through my ministry. But you know, now we don't do that. It's a rarity among our churches because we say it does not work. Or maybe we might better say, I've got better things to do on those visitation hours. And when we do visitation, we talk about everything but the gospel. And we're relieved when no one answers the door. And we hand out the track and we run. And why such indifference in America today? Why such indifference in this church? Why such indifference in churches across America? I'll tell you why there are. Because we do not expect sinners to get saved. We do not realize the power of God's at work. When you hand out the gospel, whether it be by a witness or by a track, or whether you get the man to come to church or lady and this preacher preaches the gospel, the power of God's at work. You need to believe that. Then see with me the promise of the gospel. We see the power of the gospel. Oh, I wish, I hope you believe that. If you don't, uh, Lord, help us to believe that. Because if we will get a hold that there's power in the witness for Jesus Christ, however we do it, whether it be with a track or whether it be with a sitting down telling someone the Romans are old or whatever it might be, that there's power of God at work to save that sinner. We need to believe that. Make a difference in your soul winning if you believe that. Amen. Number two, see with you the promise of the gospel. Now I'm going to have to go some other places for this. Turn your Bible to keep your place in Romans. We'll come back to it. But turn over to Matthew chapter 28. 
we know this context very well. The Lord has risen. He's coming back to his church to give instruction. And he said in verse 18, he said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Y'all underline that, folks. All power, all power, all power is given me in heaven and earth. We serve a powerful God today. Praise God, this powerful God is the God of love. Praise God, before the wrath of God that comes upon a sinner, there's a love of God reaching out to him. Amen. Got to underline that. All powers give me in heaven and earth. And then how about the next three words? Go ye therefore. In other words, the power that Jesus Christ has is in your heart today by the Holy Spirit by which to go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, once you notice with me in verse 19, the Lord does not say, and should they get saved? He does not say, if they get saved. He says, baptizing them. You know what that means? That means if you'll go out in the power of Jesus Christ and recognize the power of God is going, that is being handed to those people through the gospel, souls will get saved. You understand that? Baptizing. Not should they get saved. No, but he, they'll get saved. And they'll follow the Lord in believers' baptism. And they'll identify with the church. If we will obey the Lord and share the power of the gospel by the grace of God and expect souls to get saved, listen, souls will get saved. That's a promise of God. My question to you is, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Do you share the gospel with others? Believing sinners will get saved. I fear in this matter of soul winning in America, we are our worst enemy. You want to blame the devil for just about everything, but sometimes we need to get real with God and, and look at our hearts and realize we're the problem so much and not the devil. And we want to blame others when we're the problem. We just don't expect souls to get saved. I really believe that's a problem in America today. We'd rather talk about souls not getting saved than talking about souls that will get saved. Number three, see with me the prayer of the gospel. Romans chapter 10, verse 1, Paul said this. I'll just quote it for you. Brethren, remember we're studying Paul, the soul winner. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Can I tell you something? Along with the powerful witness of Paul, there was a prayer time, a faithful prayer time, an everyday prayer time, a throughout the day prayer time where he prayed for sinners to come to the Savior. Perhaps he knew of some people, in fact, I'm sure he did, by name. And he prayed for those by name to come to the Savior. Paul was not just a soul winner, he was a prayer warrior. And he prayed for souls to come to the Savior. I think of Matthew 9, verse 37, when the Lord looked across the multitude and he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray therefore the Lord the harvest that he'll send forth labors in his harvest. Oh, listen, soul winner. We not only need to be praying for souls to be saved and believe that God will save souls. We also need to be praying for more to enter into the, into the harvest and to, and to work in soul winning. We need to pray for more soul winners. We used to do that in our churches. We used to pray for soul winners. When the last time we've done that. James 4, verse 2 says, you have not because you ask not. And hear me on this. We're not seeing souls come to the Savior in this America like we should because we do not ask by faith and expect God to save sinners. Let me say that to you again. We're not seeing souls come to the Savior because we do not ask by faith and expect sinners to be saved. Oh, listen, in our churches, there used to be the old-fashioned prayer meetings where the men would come together, perhaps on the Saturday night. Oh, I know. Saturday's the only day you got off. I understand that. But they'd come together, and they would pray for souls to be saved. They would pray, oh, Lord God, bring sinners to the service tomorrow. Old-fashioned prayer meetings that were devoted specifically for all of myself to be right with God, but also save souls. May sinners come to the say, God, save souls. Bring them to church. Lord, help us to be a witness. Old-fashioned prayer meetings. 
I was told of a church in this village, talked to a man that went to it, it's not this one, and uh, don't try to figure it out because he will. <laughs> but I was told about this church was just growing by leaps and bounds. People were getting saved in the services. Now this was back in the, I think it was probably back in the 80s or 90s, I'm not sure when, but it wasn't very recent. It wasn't in the tw uh, 2000s, that's for sure. But uh, souls were getting saved every service. The men would come out and pray at night for souls to be saved. He said, you know, sometimes we got, we, we, we were so afraid, it, it went all night. <laughs> and we came to church and people were getting saved and, and multitudes were walking the aisle and, uh, and uh, the, the, ch the church was growing. And then we got the pastor who was a Calvinist. And he killed the zeal for soul winning. And that church does not have very many people in it today. What excites us in the church service? Beautiful choir. I like it. The hymns? Yes. The special that we had here, the good harmony? Amen. But don't let that replace a sinner coming to this church and getting saved. That's the greatest excitement. That's what we ought to anticipate. And praise God, that's what we ought to pray for. Oh, Lord God. Bring a lost sinner today. Save his soul. Bless the preacher. When a sinner walks down that aisle, praise God, there's nothing wrong saying, Amen, glory to God. And lift your hand and praise the Lord for it. Amen. Prayer. That leads to my last point. Number one, the power of the gospel. Every time you give the gospel, the power of God's at work. Do you believe that? Number two, the promise of the gospel. Sinners will be saved if we share the gospel. Do you believe that? Number three, the prayer of the gospel. Pray for souls to be saved. Pray for laborers, and the Lord will save sinners. Now, here's my fourth point. See with me the proof of the gospel. Write that down. The proof of the gospel. And look at verse 15 with me, or verse 17, rather. See, we always stop at verse 16 for some reason. We like to quote verse 16. But verse 17 goes with 16, because it says four. In other words, i got some more to say. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just. Christian, that's you. That's me. We are the just, who have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, that have been clothed in his righteousness. Paul says, the just shall live by faith. Did you know that when you got saved, to walk with God, by, you, you, are, you, are, you are to walk with God by faith in his word and his promises? We are faith people. Amen. By the way, this is a faith book. Amen. It will not become real to you until you take it by faith. Then this book really opens up to you. Amen. And so we are, we are saved to walk with God by faith. And we are to trust God to be faithful to his promises that he gives us in his word every day. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast profession of our faith without wavering. And I like this. I've used it often. I use it in my thank you letters. <laughs> For he is faithful that promised. Aren't you God, glad that when God gives a promise, he'll be faithful to do it? He's not like you and I. He's not, like, he's not broken one promise. We have. And don't be so pious to think you haven't. We all have. But not this Lord. He is faithful that promised. And we are the proof of the gospel. I wish you would put that down somehow. I am the proof of the gospel. Taking the gospel message to others by sight and not by faith. Or by faith. It's not by sight but by faith. Taking the gospel message to others not by sight but by faith. Trusting the power of God at work in the heart of the unbeliever. Trusting the promise of God that he will give an increase. Expecting sinners to get saved. And sinners will come to Jesus and be saved. You're the proof. You're the proof. It's not the sinner that walks down the aisle and gets saved. It's not the sinner that you lead to the Lord at work or your neighbor or your loved one. No, they're not the proof. They're the fruit. You're the proof. Trusting God for his power and his promise and expecting God to fulfill his promise and sinners will get saved. You know, 
There's a strange attitude of soul winning in our churches today. Very strange. I've been around for a while. I know I don't look it, but I have. And I've seen over the years the attitude of soul winning change so much. And remember, I'm in a lot of churches. I talk to a lot of pastors. And you know, it seems like our churches want to live in the past. Oh, the good old days. Oh, you know, it's not like it used to be. Oh, listen, there was one time when all the pews were filled in this church. And when the altar call was given, oh, my, the, the altar was filled with people praying. Oh, the good old days. I, I remember what it used to be like. And I hear that a lot on the road. Not just from the pastors, but some members, too, when I get to talk to them. Then I hear this. Well, you know, the reason we're not seeing people get saved like we used to, by the way, there were lots of people getting saved in America back in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and 60s and 50s. Amen. And go on back. I mean, America's rich in souls coming to the Savior. That's why we got so many churches today. Amen. And then they'll say something like this. Well, you know, the reason we're not seeing the great harvest is because we're living in the last days, you know. Can I tell you something? And I, Pastor, you can correct me. Not now, preferably. But you can correct me. But the last days began when Jesus went back to heaven. Paul was in the last days. We're in the last days. And then I hear this. Well, you know, the Bible tells us there'll be a falling away, you know. The Bible tells us iniquity shall abound and the love of many shall wax cold. And you know, really, that's why we're not seeing souls getting saved like we used to. We're so good at giving excuses for what's not happening that should be happening. And then we'll say, well, you know, uh, we, we just, you don't expect people to get saved. And by the way, here's another problem in America. Boy, don't miss this one. I've heard this so many times. America is gospel hardened. Because they've heard the gospel so much. They've heard it again and again and again and again and again. And we don't expect sinners to come to the Lord. And we measure what is happening in the, in the whole world by the little harvest of souls that we're seeing in America. And I, by the way, I'm thankful for the little harvest of souls. Don't get me wrong. But I'm trying to make a point. We, we measure the whole world by what's happening in America. Travel with me to these third world nations. See what's happening in these nations. Multitudes are coming to the Lord. America's not gospel hardened, my friend. America is gospel ignorant. Ignorant. That's our problem today. We've got ignorance among our young people. I have a, a bunch of nieces and nephews, and they know not one thing about God, brother. Not one thing about Jesus Christ. America's not gospel hardened. Now get this. Rather, God's churches are gospel hardened. See, let's quit blaming the world for the problems and for few souls coming to the Savior. Let's put the blame where it belongs. It belongs on us. We're gospel heart. And when we share the gospel, it's by sight and not by faith. We don't expect results. We don't expect sinners to get saved. The labors are few, and few sinners get saved. Christian, you're the proof of the gospel. And you know what? We have stopped complaining about America and start proclaiming the gospel wherever we go by faith. We need to be soul winners. Soul winners. The fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Soul winners. That's the call of the hour for God's churches. For this church right here. Right here. God's speaking to your hearts and stirring you and and, and, and stirring you with the, with, with the promise of the power of the gospel and the promise that sinners will get saved and the promise he'll answer your prayers if you pray for sinners to get saved. You're the proof of the gospel. And we need to stop complaining and start proclaiming. Take the gospel message to others. Trust the power of God at work. Expect sinners to get saved. And God will give an increase. I'm going to close out with this verse and turn with me to Psalm chapter 126. You know, when I accepted the Lord as my Savior back in 1971, the verse was often shared in our churches, and we were even encouraged to memorize it. I mean, this verse stuck with me all, th all through the 70s and the 80s and 90s, and, but now it's in the archives collecting dust. 
and it would rarely ever hear it used. Psalm 126, verse 5, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Amen. Tears speaks of praying. Tears speaks of crying for souls to get saved. But then it gets very personal. Look at verse 6 with me. He, that's the, that goeth forth and weepeth, praying and having a passion for lost souls and a desire for them to come to the Lord, lost loved ones, bearing precious seed, the gospel of Jesus Christ, shall doubtless, that's a promise, come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Believe it. Expect it. It's a promise of God, and God will give an increase. Dear friend, I thank God for my church. I thank God for my pastor. I thank God for, when I say my church, I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about the people. I thank God for the multitude of people that are in this room today, and Jesus is your Savior. You're heaven-bound. But I must ask you, I must ask you, are you a soul winner? Are you trusting the power of God at work? 